Welcome everyone to Bible Christians and Fellowship of the Spirit. Grace and peace in Jesus' holy name to all those that fear God and keep His commandments. The title of this lesson is Briefly Explaining the Holy Days of God. Briefly Explaining the Holy Days of God. What we're going to do is we're just going to run through all the holy days and we're just going to touch on a scripture or two to show you what each day represents. We're not going to go into the ordinances and we're not going to explain it like we would if it was in its season or if we were dealing with that particular time of year. We're just going to touch on it real quick. We're going to spend a lot of time in Leviticus, the 23rd chapter, where the Lord outlines His holy days or His feast days. So you might want to put a marker there, because we're going to be moving rather quickly. So we're going to start this off in Leviticus 23, Leviticus 23, and we're going to pick it up at verse 2. Leviticus 23 and verse 2. Go ahead, brother. Speak unto the children of Israel, uh -huh. saying unto them, Concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Now look what the Lord tells Moses to tell Israel. Concerning the feast of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, or holy gatherings, even these are my feasts. So everything in this chapter, the Lord is calling part of his feasts. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, brother. Verse 3. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to rest, uh -huh. and holy convocation. Uh -huh. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. So the first day that the Lord calls one of his feasts, it's the weekly Sabbath day. Mm -hmm. The weekly Sabbath day. Let's go to Exodus, the 20th chapter. Exodus, the 20th chapter. Remember, keep your finger here, because we're going to keep coming back to Leviticus chapter 23 throughout this lesson. Exodus 20. Exodus 20, and let's pick this up at verse 8. 20 and 8. Go ahead, brother. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. One of the Lord's feast days. Go ahead. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. Uh -huh. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord the thy God. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. No matter how they start to twist the calendars in this end times, the Sabbath day is the seventh day, which today is... In these times is Saturday. Go ahead, brother. And in it thou shalt not do any work. Uh -huh. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. One more verse, brother. For in six days God made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So the first feast day the Lord calls out is the Sabbath day. Let's go to Revelation, the 20th chapter. This is what the Sabbath day represents. Revelation 20. Revelation 20, and we're going to read one verse, brother. 20 and verse 6. 20 and 6. Go ahead. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. Uh -huh. On such a second death have no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. And this is what the Lord's Sabbath day represents. It represents the kingdom of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And those, when you make that first resurrection, you'll be priests of God and of Christ and you'll reign with him a thousand years. That's what the Sabbath represents. Let's go back to Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. Remember, we're not going into detail in any of these days. We're just going to lay it out with just one or two verses to show you what each day represents. Leviticus 23, and pick it up at verse 4, brother. 23 and 4. Go ahead. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which ye shall proclaim in their season. And you deal with these days in their season. In other words, in that time of the year, you'll have an in-depth lesson on these particular days. Go ahead, brother. In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. And the Lord's year starts in the springtime. When you start seeing a physical change, the leaves start coming back out. All the trees and everything start budding. The grass starts growing after being dormant all winter long. You have a physical change. That's the beginning of the Lord's year. But what we're dealing with right now is the Passover. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, the 5th chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 5th chapter. 1 Corinthians 5 and 1 verse, brother, verse 7. 5 and 7. Go ahead. Heard thou therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ our Passover is sacrificed and for us. That's what the Passover points toward. It points toward the propitiation of our, of our Messiah, Jesus the Christ, of his death and his resurrection. That's what the Passover points toward. Let's go back to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Again, we're going to be in Leviticus for the next 15 or 20 minutes. In and out of Leviticus. Leviticus 23, and pick it up at verse 6, brother. Go ahead. Verse 6. 
And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. So the fourteenth day you've got the Passover. The fifteenth day of the first month starts the feast of unleavened bread. Go ahead. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Uh huh. Uh, verse seven. In the first day you shall have an holy convocation. You shall do no sort of our work therein. Go ahead, brother. But ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord seven days. And the seventh day is an holy convocation. You shall do no sort of our work therein. So the next one of the Lord's feast days is known as the feast of unleavened bread. Let's go back to First Corinthians, the fifth chapter, and we're going to touch on one verse, verse eight. First Corinthians um, five and verse eight. Go ahead. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And that's what the Feast of Unleavened Bread is about. It's about putting away that old man, or putting the way we used to live, putting sin far from us. That's why it is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. In other words, without sin. Let's continue. Let's go back to Leviticus 23. And we're going to pick this up at verse 10. Leviticus 23 and pick it up at verse 10. Go ahead, brother. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I gave unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. Uh -huh. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to accept for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So now the morrow after the Sabbath, after the Passover... You've got this perfect sacrifice, and it's being waved. This, this sheath is being waved by the priest. What this represents, it represents the, the, the resurrection of Jesus. Go ahead and continue. And you shall offer that day when ye wave the sheath in the lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. Now it's a he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. This lamb was a perfect sacrifice. This points to Jesus. Go ahead. And the meat offering thereof shall be two ten deals of fine flour mingled with oil, and an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet Savior. And the drink offering thereof shall be a wine, the fourth part of a hen. Skip down to 15 and continue, brother. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths unto the Lord. So now it shall be completed. Now you're going to start your count toward Pentecost. Or the feast of the first fruits. Go ahead. Verse uh, 16. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto the Lord. Uh -huh. And ye shall bring out of your habitation two ways loaves of ten, two ten deals. Then shall be fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. Now in verse 17, you shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two tenth deals. They shall be a fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. What this represents is the, the first resurrection. That's what this represents. Go ahead and continue, brother. 18. And you shall offer it with the bread seven lambs without blemish uh -huh. in the first year. One young bullock, two rams. They shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord. With their meat offerings, they... And their drink offerings, even an offering made by fire of a sweet Savior unto the Lord. Skip to 20 and continue. 20. The priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord with two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for, your, for the priest. Uh-huh. 21. And ye shall claim on the self same day that it may be in holy convocation unto you. Ye shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statue forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. So all these feast days are statutes forever throughout in all your dwellings throughout your generations. Every one of these feast days is a statute forever. Let's go to 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter. Let's take a look at what Pentecost represents. 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 verse, brother, verse 20. 15 and 20, go ahead. Now, But now Christ, risen from the dead, and became the first fruits of them that slept. Now Jesus, risen from the dead, became the first fruits of them that slept. This is that perfect lamb offering. Skip down to verse 23 and read 23, brother. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterwards, they that are Christ that is coming. So Christ the first fruits, then afterward, they that are Christ that is coming. So this represents Jesus being the first one that ever walked in the flesh, getting that spiritual body, and it also represents the first resurrection, or those counted worthy 
to live with Jesus in that in that first kingdom. Now let's continue. Let's go back to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Leviticus 23, and we're going to pick it up at verse 24, brother. 23 and 24. Go ahead. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, ye shall ye have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, and holy convocation. A Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. Now this is what we call rightly dividing. Let's look at this real quick. This is what one of my teachers calls learning something on the way to learning something. The, the ones that call themselves Jews, that the book says they call themselves Jews that are not, the ones living in Israel right now that we know as being Edom or Esau, the Edomites, they say that at this time of the year, that that is the beginning of the new year. But the book calls it the seventh month, the first day of the month. Just something to think about. And this is the memorial of the blowing of trumpets. Did you finish 25, brother? No, not yet. 25, go ahead. Ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. 1 Thessalonians, the fourth chapter. 1 Thessalonians 4, and brother, we're just going to read one verse. 1 Thessalonians 4, and we're going to read verse 16. 4 and verse 16. When you get it, brother, go ahead. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16. Yes, sir. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And that's what the memorial of the blowing of trumpets is all about. It's about that trump, the trump of God. And there's all kinds of trumpets that this book talks about. There's trumpets for the watchmen to blow. There's trumpets that happen when the Lord commands you to blow trumpets. Every time the Messiah or our Master, Jesus Christ, appeared somewhere when he was God, there was trumps of God. There were angels with trumpets. Every time he appeared to anybody, he always had angels and trumpets were blowing. And then you've got in Revelation, you got the seven trumps of God. That's what the memorial of the blowing of trumpets is dealing with. But it's mainly dealing with that last trump, with the return of the Messiah. Let's go back to Leviticus, the 23rd chapter. Leviticus 23, and brother, we're going to pick it up at verse 27. 23 and 27, go ahead. Also on the 10th day of, the, of this month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be in the holy convocation unto you. Uh -huh. Ye shall afflict your souls, and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. Yes, sir. And ye shall do no work in that same day. For it is a day of atonement, to make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. Go ahead, brother. For whatsoever, for whatsoever soul it be, that shall not be afflicted in that same day. Uh -huh. He shall be cut off from among his people. So now we have the day of atonement, which is a day of fasting or a day of affliction. Because when you fast, even for 24 hours, no matter how much you fast, if you fast for 24 hours, you're going to get afflicted in a way. You're going to get, you're going to be thirsty. You're, you might get a, a, a parched throat. You might not be, if you talk a lot, you might not be able to continue talking because you're not wetting your whistle, so to speak. And when you're going without food, you start getting hungry. Sometimes you get those hunger pains. You get that headache going on when you get hungry or when you get thirsty. So it's a day of atonement. Go ahead, brother. Verse 30. And whatsoever soul it be that doeth any work in that same day, that same soul will I destroy from among his people. One more verse. Ye shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all of your dwellings. A statute forever throughout all your generations in all your dwellings. You know what? One more verse, brother. 32. It shall be unto you a Sabbath to rest, and ye shall afflict your souls. And the ninth day of the month at even, from even to evening, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. And the day of atonement, the Lord's even telling us how to celebrate our days, our Sabbath days from evening to evening. But let's go to Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Isaiah 53, and brother, we're going to pick it up at verse 3. 53 and verse 3. Go ahead. He is the sorrows <coughs> rejected of men, a man of sorrow, acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now there's a lot of teachings about the Day of Atonement, and there's a lot of different teachings I had at the day of, of on the Day of Atonement. But what the Day of Atonement represents, it represents bringing into remembrance the sufferings of your Messiah, of your Savior, of Jesus Christ. Go ahead, brother. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. 
Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. Uh -huh. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes we are healed. Go ahead. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Uh -huh. He was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet we owe it not his yet he owed not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shearers, he is dumb, so he owe it not his mouth. Uh -huh. He was stricken from prison, and he was taken from prison and from judgment, and was declared who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And the, the, the way that Jesus conducted himself on this earth is supposed to be an example for us. Christian means Christ-like. Notice Jesus never said a word. He was wrongly accused. He was falsely accused. He never even opened up his mouth as a lamb before his shears. That's what the Day of Atonement represents. Mm -hmm. Our little suffering without food and drink. Oh, I'm so hungry. Oh, I'm thirsty. Oh, quit your whining. It's for one day. <laughs> right. And it's supposed to remember what your Messiah did for you. Mm -hmm. The way he suffered. First time I ever saw the Passion of the Christ when they're whipping him. Oh, man. And that's just a Hollywood movie. Let alone the way they, they the book says they beat him, they punched him, they falsely accused him, they made fun of him, they mocked him. We get a little persecution, people mocking us or whatever. Oh, man, it's so grievous. Imagine what our master went through. The Day of Atonement gives us that one day to totally reflect on the way he suffered for each and every one of us. Let's go back to Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23, and we're going to pick it up at verse 34, brother. 23 and 34. Speak, Go ahead. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this month shall be the Feast of Tabernacles for seven days unto the Lord. Uh -huh. On the first day shall be in holy convocation. You shall do no servile work there. So now we have the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Ingathering. Go ahead, brother. 36. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be in holy convocation yes, unto you. You shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall do no servile work therein. Go ahead, brother. These are the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering, and a meat offering, a sacrifice, a drink offering, everything upon this de his yes, day. Yes, sir. Go ahead, brother. Besides the Sabbath of the Lord, besides your gifts, besides all your vows, and besides all your free will offering, which you shall give unto the Lord. So besides all of these, you got to keep these feast days because this is the plan of God's, or God's plan for man's salvation lies within these feast days. One more verse, 39. Also in the 15th day of the seventh month, when ye have gathered in the fruit of the land, ye shall keep a feast unto the Lord seven days. So you're supposed to feast unto the Lord for seven days. He gave you seven days to feast at the end of the year when you've gathered in all the rest of your harvest in the fall before the weather turns. This is food you're going to eat all winter long. Seven days, the Lord says, you're supposed to feast. Go ahead. On the first day shall be a Sabbath, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath. So you feast for seven days. The first day is a commanded high holy day. And after you're done feasting for seven days, then you gather on the eighth day, and you hold the solemn assembly. Let's go to Isaiah, the 56th chapter. Isaiah, the 56th chapter. And we're going to read one verse, brother. 56 and verse 8. Go ahead. The Lord... The Lord God, which gathered the outcasts of Israel, saith, Yet will I gather others to him besides those that are gathered unto him. And that's what Feast of Tabernacles is all about. It's about the gathering of all those that have taken hold of God's covenant and keep his commandments. It's a gathering of the nation of Israel, no matter where they've been scattered, that they've repented and they have come back to God and they're fearing him and keeping his commandments and serving him. And all those that through their teaching are brought on to the, to, to the Lord, are, are uh, brought unto him, and the strangers that take hold of his covenant and keep his commandments and fear him, it's a gathering of all of them that are righteous in God's eyes. That's the first seven days. Let's go to Revelation, the 21st chapter, and tell you what the eighth day points to. Revelation 21. And pick it up at verse 1, brother, 21 and 1. Go ahead. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. 
For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Yes, sir. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Uh -huh. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacles of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And this eighth day represents the coming of the Father's kingdom. That's why when you're commanded to be circumcised on the eighth day and you lose that flesh of the foreskin, that points toward the eighth day when the Father himself comes down and there is no more flesh and blood. That losing of the flesh on the eighth day represents the start of the Father's kingdom. One, one more verse, brother, this will be it. Verse 4. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, yes, sir. and there shall be no more death, no more death. neither sorrow, uh -huh. neither crying, yes, sir. neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And at that time, you're either righteous in God's eyes, and you're in His kingdom with Him, or you're wicked in God's eyes, and you're in the fire with Satan one way or the other. But this is briefly explaining the holy days of God. If you ever have any questions on this or any other biblical topic, feel free to hit us. So we thank you for the opportunity to rightly divide God's word, and we hope that somebody got something from this lesson. In Jesus' name. Amen.